In my right hand, I am holding a tiny little paper ketchup cup. This tiny little paper ketchup top cup, what most people don't know is that less than 1% of these ketchup cups ever reach their full potential. And that is a made up statistic to get your attention. <laughs> In all seriousness, these little tiny paper ketchup cups, when you go to get them, how many do you have to fill up with ketchup? So like one or two? How many? This is a participation part of the program. Three, five, a tray full. What most people don't know is that there's little folds in this paper ketchup cup that if you pop it open can turn to three times its size. Where in your life do you have untapped potential that's hiding in plain sight? Maybe it's not hiding at all. Maybe you, you know your own potential. It's just you didn't do anything about it because you don't want to challenge the status quo. Or maybe because you just want to, you know, be like everybody else. Or because you, you know, you thought you were doing the right thing at that time and you didn't speak up. And now your car payment is more expensive than you thought it was going to be because you didn't try to pull at the folds that are right in front of you. Or maybe because you just didn't know what to say. You ever have one of those moments where you're like, I feel like I could have gotten what I wanted if I just knew what to say? You ever had those moments? We're going to flip that script today. There are three words to getting what you want. I teach these words to people around the world, and I'm going to share them with you today so you can start getting what you want. Those three words are decided, those L-Y words. You know the L-Y words? Typically, usually, normally, ordinarily, so the L-Y words. And the last one is the most powerful persuasive word, which is the word because. And we're going to explore these three words and help us remember them. I've created a little cheeky expression for us. It's decidedly because changes what was. Decidedly because changes what was. These three words, decided, the L-Y words, and because can change everything for us if we know when to listen for them and what to do once we hear them. Now, I'm going to share with you a couple of stories, and we're going to have an interactive exercises. We're going to do our own little studies here, and we're going to see how do these words show up in our lives, and how come we're missing them, these paper-folded cups in our lives, and we're not hearing them. What's happening to us, and what do we do in those moments? I'm the oldest of three children. I have two younger sisters. My husband is the oldest of three children. He has a younger brother and a younger sister. When my husband and I got married, we all thought, both of us and our families, that we would end up with three kids. That was our dream right out of the gate, right? So we come from a family of three. We're going to have three. After we gave birth to Angus, we realized how wrong our dream was. It wasn't going to happen. We struggled with infertility for seven years. And uh, I'm not alone. Uh, statistics show, according to the CDC, it's about 8 million women are struggling with fertility and carrying the baby. For me, I had three miscarriages. Uh, one of the miscarriages happened in a room similar to this on a stage, speaking in front of 1,482 people while on the stage. And I remember, uh, I guess we're not going to give birth to more kids. I remember thinking that dream is, is over. And then I discovered something called an egg donor. I never heard of such a thing. And what it is, is it's, it's an anonymous egg donor, a woman, who donates her eggs, and we can get them and match them up with my husband's DNA, and then I carry the babies. Could this be? Could this work for us? Is this, is this the path that we're going to take? We weren't sure. So we, we were all excited. We got the money together. It's pretty expensive. You know, we had to borrow some money from my parents. And, and, and we go into the nurse and we see the fertility nurse and we say, okay, here's our plan. And had you been with us, you would have heard her say, the doctor decided, based on us using an egg donor, this would be the protocol. And she showed up with this Mac Daddy giant needle. Like, this looks like something you'd use in the Olympics, like to do a pole vault or something. It was like this, I mean, literally, I had already done in vitro with little teeny, like, diabetic-sized needles, but this monster, you got to be kidding me. And I saw it. You, have you ever had an experience where you did one of these facial expressions, you went like this, <sighs> you know, you just hold your breath and your cheeks puff out, that's what happened here, and I looked at her, and had you been with me, you would have heard me say, uh, what's up with that, 
What's up with that needle right there? She goes, oh, you're going to need to take this twice a day for the month before getting pregnant and every day during your first trimester. I burst out crying. I knew immediately our dream once again was squished. We will not be carrying more kids. And the reason I knew that had nothing to do with the needle or the fact that I needed to take two of them at 160 days of my life, but I had to take them at exact times during the day. Now, let me back up. Uh, I'm retired from federal law enforcement. I worked for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms for 17 years. My dad said I turned my hobbies into a career, (laughs) drinking, smoking, and shooting. Uh, I don't do any of those things uh, anymore. And... uh, I worked for ATF for 17 years. I I wrote, my specialty was firearms trafficking, analytic interviewing, and I later did, created courses on leadership. And I wrote a couple books. They did really well, translated into different languages. And I'm telling you this because this means as a consultant today, I go out and consult with companies on how to find the untapped potential hidden in the folds of their employees. How can you find that untapped potential that's right there in front of us? I fly over 100 trips a year. That's over 250 flights. All I could imagine is this like Mac Daddy needle, like I'm in line in England going through security and I'm like, oh, it's 235, let me pull my pants down and put a giant needle in my butt or in my thigh. I was devastated until I took a second and I rewound what she said to me. What she said to me was the doctor decided Decided does not mean executed on. Decided means there's another way. Decided is our first of our three words. Decidedly because changes what was. Decided is our first word. Decidedly because changes what was. She said we decided. She just gave me a a little paper ketchup cup. Let's do an experiment. We're all going grocery shopping together, and we get 12 items at the grocery store, and we put them on the conveyor belt, but I decide to put one thing back, the very expensive facial lotion. It's just ridiculously overpriced. So we have 12 things. I decide to put one back. How many do we buy? Many of you will think in your heads, 11, and I hear some people shouting out 11, right? You're like, well, Janine, you said there were 12. You put one back, so 12 minus one is 11. I didn't say I put one back, though. I said I decided to put one back. When someone says the word decided, it does not mean it's executed on. I could say I decided to put it back and then change my mind and decided to buy it again last minute. Now, maybe you're like my husband and you're like, all right, this is ridiculous. You're like playing with semantics here on the words. If you decide to do something, Janine, it means you do it. If you decided not to buy it, then you wouldn't buy it. So let's do another experiment. Here we go. How many of you, I want you to raise your hands, how many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution to do anything? Like you made a New Year's resolution, you decided to quit smoking, you decided to lose weight, you decided to become a vegan, you decided to ask, this was the year you're asking for a raise, you decided to have more kids, you decided to get married, you decided to come out of the club, whatever it is. How many of you have ever made a New Year's resolution ever in your life? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. Now, I want you to put your hand down if... You did not execute on that decision in the time you expected to execute on it. What happened? I thought you decided on doing it. Life happened. That's what happened, right? You decided to do it. It sounded good in the moment when everyone else was deciding stuff. And then life happened. Decided does not mean we've executed on it. There there was a study done at Scranton University, and what they discovered is that anyone who decides to do something on as a New Year's resolution, only 8% of us actually meet that that decision that we made. Only 8% of us. Let's go back to the grocery store. Where does this word decided live? What I found out is working with corporations across the globe is they would always ask me way beyond how do I find and untap into this hidden potential. They would ask me about motivations. They would say things like, well, how is my client or my patients or my my employees, you know, how are they motivated to spend their time and energy with decision making? And decision-making kept being brought up a lot in motivation. So I did what anyone would do in this situation. I Googled to see if I could find out the answer. And I found a program at Columbia College in Chicago. And it was a decision-making program that linked body movement to how we make decisions. And I took this year-long certification program, and now I'm what's called a decision profiler. 
And what I learned is while we drastically make decisions differently, what we all have in common is we all go through the same three stages of decision making. So let's go back to the grocery store. I'm going to show you these three stages of decision making. All of us go through this. So the first stage is research. This is when you're in the grocery store, you're looking around, and you're trying to just get the lay of the land. So you're either investigating, you're looking at the labels, or you're exploring, and you're seeing what's down here versus what's down here. This air stage of decision making is called research, that yellow box. In the orange box, this is where we do reasoning. This is, I'm going to take the wheat bread. No, I'm going to take the, I'm going to get the Italian bread. Oh, no, no, let's get the organic milk. Well, let's not get milk. Let's, let's get um, uh, almond milk instead. This is where you reason. This is where we stand our ground. This is where determining lives and evaluating lives here. What's important to me? What am I willing to take a stand for? What are my priorities? The why lives in this orange box of reasoning. The last step is the result, the, the blue box. This is where you buy the groceries and you literally are walking out of the grocery store. It is the result. The decision has been made. While the yellow box and the blue box are interesting, what we're going to be talking about today is that orange box, reasoning. All three of our words live in reasoning. They're roommates with one another. Decidedly because changes what was. I decided that I would never use drugs. If you're an HR person or, or you're a recruiter and you ask a potential employee, have you ever done drugs? And they say, I decided in high school I'd never do drugs. Please don't write down stated they never did drugs. Just because someone decided to do it doesn't mean he wasn't snorting cocaine in the car to get a little boost of energy for the, uh, for the big interview. What about if you ask your boss for a raise and your boss says, hey, listen, after we looked at our budget, you know, we decided ah, we're just not going to be able to give you a raise this year. You know what that is? That's a paper ketchup cup right there. Your boss just told you if you fight for it, you can get it. And, and the last thing you want to do is find out that everybody else that has your same position did fight for it and they got it and you didn't. Here's my rule of thumb. Before, whether it's decided or whether it's these L-Y words we're going to go into a second, I say this. I believe that God created earth in how many days? Seven days, right? So God creates earth, right? And I think at the end of him creating earth, he does one of these. Not bad. Not bad. So for me, what I say is at the end of seven days for me, on that seventh day as it's ending, I say to myself, am I going to clap my hands and say, not bad? Or am I going to say, I wish I had opened up that opportunity? I wish I had pushed the boundaries just a little bit more. 